This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. New normal. An influential central banker says investors should get used to slower economic growth. Power outage. The GE unit is a source of pain for the company, and it could take years, not months, to fix. Blazing new trails. Could fire-resistant homes be the answer to California's growing wildfire risk? Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Wednesday, March the 6th. And good evening, everyone, and welcome. Today, we got new information on the health of the economy. And we begin tonight with comments from a voting member of the Federal Reserve Board who said tailwinds have turned into headwinds and described the economy as having entered a new normal. That new normal means slower growth. John Williams, the president of the New York Fed, cited three factors, a global slowdown, geopolitical uncertainty, and also tighter financial conditions. But he also added that slower growth is not necessarily cause for alarm. How much should our economy be expected on a normal average year to grow? And our current estimate is around 2%. So when we see the slowdown, you shouldn't be, people shouldn't be saying, well, what's happening to the economy that would cause you to think that this would be down to 2%. In fact, this would be actually something considered more normal, 2% growth in, this, in, the new, in the new economy, new normal economy. Mr. Williams says that allows the central bank to be flexible and patient when it comes to raising interest rates. And the Federal Reserve also altered its description of the economy in its latest beige book. That is the anecdotal look at the economy across the country, which was released today. Ten of the Fed's 12 districts saw slight to moderate growth in late January and February. Now, that's being viewed as more downbeat compared to its typical modest to moderate phrase. Some of that was due, in fact, to the partial government shutdown, which the Fed says hit a number of sectors, including retail, real estate and manufacturing. And the manufacturing sector also cited higher costs due to tariffs. And on the trade front, the deficit rose to a record, hitting $891 billion last year. The U.S. imported more goods than ever, including from China. Economists say the rise was due to things like a global economic slowdown and a strengthening dollar, which weakened overseas demand for American products. Yesterday, Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan gave his assessment of the economy, and he focused on the continued rise of debt levels. In his statement, he said an elevated level of corporate debt, along with the high level of U.S. government debt, is likely to mean that the U.S. economy is much more interest rate sensitive than it has been historically. So with future Fed rate increases on hold, does that mean that rates are about as high as they're going to go for the foreseeable future? And if that's the case, what does that mean for savers and investors? Joining us tonight is Phil Blancato. He's the CEO of Ladenburg Thalman Asset Management. Phil, always good to see you. Thanks for joining us Thank tonight. Thank you for having me. So John Williams says tailwinds are now headwinds, expect slower growth. And Robert Kaplan is looking at an interest sense of an economy. If rates are as high as they're going to be for the foreseeable future, what does that mean for savers and investors, do you think? This is the new normal. Yeah, in some ways, it's a Goldilocks environment because we don't have a lot of inflation. Right. We're seeing wages above 3%, which is great. But without real inflation, you just don't get higher rates. So to me, this is the new normal. And that if you really look at the history of interest rates, 3% is about the norm on the 10-year U.S. Treasury going back to the 1900s. So unfortunately, this is the norm. You know, but in that case, to Bill's point about what does it mean to savers, that's when people start to look for yield in other parts of the market. And sometimes they take on more risk than they probably should have. Do you anticipate that happening or no? I do, because we have a double-edged sword going on right now. On one hand, the search for yield or the reach for yield, and that makes people who need the income do things they, mm -hmm. they're not accustomed to, take on risk. But on the other hand, the slowing U.S. economy, which was forecast and you heard a little bit about, now a situation where some of the debt may go bad. So now it's real about having a, a plan, being strategic, not reaching to where you could afford, the, where, just where you can afford the risk, but not taking a loss. So it's, it's problematic that lower for longer, it's better than what it was a few years ago, right. but still a risky environment where we're searching for yield. Yeah, those passbook saving accounts still, still don't right. bring a whole lot no. in here. So do, where do you go for income right now? Uh, uh, 
bearing in mind they have to balance the risks mm -hmm. with the rates, huh? Well, for one, we've all been shorter in our maturities for a while, shorter in duration. If rates level off, you can extend duration out a little bit. So, for example, we can go maybe buy a five-year bond or a seven-year bond if you can just hold it to maturity if you're buying the real bond. That's one way to do it. The other way is look for equities that are yielding decent, decent income. The MLP market, BDCs, but even Verizon, for example, you know, over a 4% dividend. Right. So that does come with volatility. It's still equity market risk, but at least you can get some income to supplement what you're not getting on the bond side. Good Very advice. Good. Phil Boncato with Ladenberg Feldman Asset Management. Good Thank to you. see you again. Thanks. Good to see you. On Wall Street, the major indexes posted three straight days of declines. Investors also tried to make sense of ADP's private payroll report, which saw slightly fewer jobs created than expected. As a result, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 133 points to 25,673. The Nasdaq was down 70, and the S&P 500 declined 18. Elsewhere, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has issued a gloomy outlook for the global economy. The group's new forecast is for 3.3 percent growth, which is down from its last forecast of 3.5 percent, which was issued in November. One of its chief concerns is growth in China and in Europe and a slowdown in trade and manufacturing worldwide. To shore up its economy, China is outlining a strategy to attract investment. And its leaders are also speaking out on the crackdown on Huawei, one of China's most important tech companies. Yunus Yun is in Beijing with the details. The message out of China's Congress today is that foreign investors are welcome here. At a press conference, the top state planner talked up the new foreign investment law, reiterating that one of the sore points with the U.S. trade negotiators, forced technology transfers in exchange for market access, would no longer be allowed. However, Chinese officials still don't acknowledge that this is a widespread problem. Meanwhile, Huawei CFO is expected to appear in court today in Vancouver as part of proceedings to set her extradition hearing date. Beijing has demanded that Meng Wanzhou be released immediately. To understand why the Chinese government seems to be so extreme, one business consultant told me that it might be good to think of Meng Wanzhou as China's equivalent to Ivanka Trump. Huawei isn't a state company, but it's a national champion, so the line between private and government is blurred in that sense. So imagine what the Trump administration would do to get her back. Lawyers tell me to influence the proceedings. China's options are to, one, pressure Canada to dismiss the extradition request or to convince President Trump to get the extradition request withdrawn. This week, we saw the Communist Party Commission accusing two detained Canadians of gathering secrets. Customs authorities also revoked an export permit for a Canadian canola firm. Chinese authorities, though, have not related these two events with the Huawei case. Expectations are also high that President Xi is going to ask President Trump to include her release as part of the trade deal. A third option is for Beijing to allow the legal proceedings to continue without comment. That's been Huawei's take, that she hasn't done anything wrong, and the courts would come to the same conclusion. And in fact, some in the public here believe that Beijing's strong reaction undermines Huawei's position that it is completely separate from the government. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eunice Yoon in Beijing. Time to take a look now at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. We begin with shares of VMware, which were downgraded to sell from neutral at Goldman Sachs. The analyst there cites the potential for lower demand for VMware's software as some companies adopt that new type of cloud technology. Price target now $177. The stock fell more than 1% today to $170.12. TripAdvisor was downgraded to underperform from market perform at Cowan. The analyst there cited a weak start to 2019 for the company and the prospect of fewer visitors to its site. Price target, $40. The stock fell 3% to $50.65. And CSX was downgraded to hold from buy at Stiefel Nicholas. The analyst says that he no longer sees a solid reason why that stock should outperform the market over the next 12 months. Price target, $47. The stock was down a fraction today to $72 and a nickel. The slide in General Electric stock extends into day two. We told you yesterday about the CEO's downbeat outlook for cash flow. And today, an analyst called his $6 price target on the stock generous, and that sent the shares down nearly 8 percent in today's session. Morgan Brennan takes a closer look at what's happening inside GE. Years, not months. 
That was the takeaway from Larry Culp this week after the General Electric CEO said industrial cash flow would be negative this year. With respect to cash, you see we were at four and a half billion last year. I think as we come into 19 for the year, we're gonna, we're gonna be in negative territory. This will be a, a year where we'll have both operating and non operating pressures on our free cash. The power business continues to be a key source of pain. This year, it will bring higher restructuring costs, and Culp warned that a turnaround in the segment could still take years. The comments sent shares tumbling, threatening a rally that's seen the stock rise more than 40 percent from its December low. Analysts are mixed on what it all means, with some warning the road ahead may still get tougher, while others believe the stock is a buy for the long term. We've got organic growth, smaller company, right, because we've been divesting assets. We've got margins improving. Okay, there's operating cash flow from continuing, and then you got all these legacy issues, and then those legacy issues will still some be there in 2020, but they'll come down, and you know this this rig will start rolling. Uncertainty also swirls around GE's financial arm, Capital, which Culp said would require four billion dollars this year. Notable for a unit that, as recently as 2017, was profitable and contributing to the company's bottom line. Under Culp, who took the helm in October, GE has been moving fast to sell assets and pay down debt, including a $21 billion sale of the biopharma business to Danaher, which was announced last week. But the devil will be in the details, and we'll get more of those in the coming days. Tomorrow, GE will disclose details about its troubled long-term care insurance business, and then next Thursday, it will share its outlook. Guidance investors seek after GE pulled its previous targets last fall. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan at the New York Stock Exchange. And still ahead, why Las Vegas may become boring. Elon Musk is known for Tesla and SpaceX, but don't forget that he also founded The Boring Company, which aims to change the way we travel through tunnels. And now the company is on the verge of launching a new project in the heart of Las Vegas. Contessa Brewer has a first look at the proposal. Elon Musk's energized over his high-speed transportation tunnels. At 150 miles an hour. That'd be ph phenomenal. Now his company, The Boring Company, is proposing one for Nevada. The Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, LVCVA, is spending $1.4 billion to renovate and expand a massive campus. You know, we've been the um, top uh, city uh, for trade shows 24 years in a row. Uh, we certainly aim to keep uh, that title. Moving customers over 200 acres is a challenge and seen as crucial to competing successfully against other cities for mega conferences. The Boring Company is proposing an underground people mover in a tunnel called a loop. This kind of innovation um, is an attraction in and of itself. Uh, it helps uh, our customers to experience everything on our campus. And at an attractive price tag of 35 to 55 million dollars, a fraction of a competing above ground proposal. It's likely to be the Boring Company's first commercial project and could boost future prospects. Boring unveiled a test tunnel in December, but proposals in Chicago, LA, and DC have been stymied by complex bureaucracy and not in my backyard backlash. The company president told us we won't use eminent domain. If a project tunnels under 100 landowners, we need strict permission from each one. In Las Vegas, there's just one owner, and the LVCVA only needs the green light from Clark County. City leaders are already anticipating ways the loop might connect all of the Strip, the airport, the new Raiders Stadium, maybe even Los Angeles. We will work uh, to look for a way to responsibly say yes to it, um, if it is what makes sense uh, for Las Vegas. The LVCVA board votes next week. If the proposal passes as expected, a final contract could be approved by June, and the people mover moving people by the end of 2020. That would be a big win for the city of Sin. Contessa Brewer, Nightly Business Report. Abercrombie and Fitch's turnaround efforts appear to be paying off. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus with the teen retailer expecting sales to increase this fiscal year. 
company's been revamping its stores and adding a broader selection of merchandise to uh, appeal to more shoppers. And with its latest earnings report, Abercrombie & Fitch did top analyst expectations for the most recent quarter. The stock rose 20% today to $25.70. But it was a different story after the bell for fellow teen retailer American Eagle. That company forecast current quarter profits below analyst estimates as it continues to spend heavily on marketing. Shares fell in the initial after hours trading this evening, but they did finish the regular session up 4% to 2132. Dollar Tree beat fourth quarter earnings and revenue estimates, but they did reveal that its family dollar brand is struggling. So the retailer announced plans to shut nearly 400 family dollar stores and to renovate 1,000 more. The renovated locations will then begin selling alcohol and include a $1 section with Dollar Tree merchandise. Shares were up more than 5% today to 135. And BJ's Wholesale Club beat profit and sales expectations. Revenue from membership fees rose 11%. Shares were solidly higher before the market opened, but then enthusiasm sort of faded and closed down more than 3.5% to 2562. Brown Foreman beat earnings expectations but missed on revenue. The maker of Jack Daniels says it was hurt after Europe, Canada and China imposed tariffs on whiskey to retaliate against U.S. tariffs. The company also lowered its full year guidance. Shares were down more than 5 percent to 48.85. ExxonMobil is telling investors to brace for higher spending. The company expects capital expenditures to grow by $4 billion this year as it focuses on deep water offshore drilling projects. Exxon added that its profit potential looks better than it did last year, but the shares lost 1% to 79.28. The FDA has approved a new drug to treat depression. The medicine made by a unit of Johnson & Johnson is made with ketamine, a powerful anesthetic that has been used illegally as the club drug Special K. The drug can only be administered by an approved health care provider and it cannot be taken home. J&J &J was up a fraction today to 139.09. A number of high tax states have been blaming the new tax law for a shortfall in revenue. But it turns out that's not the only reason. Robert Frank explains. Many of the richest states from New York to California saw unexpected multi-billion dollar drop-offs in tax revenues in December and January. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo saying last month that the state collected $2.3 billion less than he expected, and he blamed the new federal tax law, which limited state and local tax deductions, and he claimed it was driving the wealthy out of New York. SALT encourages high-income New Yorkers to move to other states. And what you have to remember is even if a small number of high-income taxpayers leave, it has a dramatic effect on this tax base. Tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich. We did. Now, God forbid the rich leave. Almost every other high-tax state, from California to Connecticut, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, reported major shortfalls in December and January compared with the forecast. California's tax receipts came in $3.4 billion light. But tax experts and accountants tell me the fall wasn't probably due to the wealth flight, but more to the stock market, specifically that big drop in December. The biggest source of the shortfalls was estimated payments. Now, those are payments made for non-wage income, usually from investments or businesses. Now, tax advisors say wealthy investors sold stock in December during those market declines to get the tax losses. That lowered their tax bills for the year, but it also created a shortfall for the states. Now, Moody's saying in a report that the revenue decline was owed in part to a volatile stock market's impact on capital gains income. The markets are back, of course, this year, but those losses can be carried forward, so we will see if there is more of a price to pay for those December declines. Now, states that don't have much exposure to the stock market have been faring a lot better. Arkansas, Wisconsin, and South Carolina, whose populations aren't as tied to Wall Street hedge funds or stock-based compensation, all reported recent surpluses. And get this, they're planning to return money to the taxpayers. Now, for the states, there is a price to pay for having their fortunes so closely tied to the 1% and the stock markets that drive their wealth. For Nightly Business Report, 
I'm Robert Frank. Coming up, burning down the house and a new effort to prevent that from happening. The U.S. division of denim and clothing maker and retailer Diesel is filing for bankruptcy. The company has struggled for a decade now with mounting financial losses amid bad investments. Diesel plans to exit Chapter 11 with fewer stores and a new strategy that it hopes will help it return to profitability. Fuel efficiency hit a record in the 2017 model year with cars and trucks getting on average nearly 25 miles per gallon. The agency administrator says there are legitimate concerns, though, about the industry's ability to meet the new requirements. Last summer, the government unveiled a proposal to freeze fuel economy requirements at 2020 levels through the year 2026. General Motors' plant in Lordstown, Ohio, is closing two days earlier than planned. That factory made its last Chevy cruise today, as a matter of fact. The move by General Motors is part of a strategy to shift away from sedans and more toward higher margin trucks and SUVs. The Lordstown plant had been producing cars for 50 years. Its closing will eliminate about 1,700 hourly positions. California just saw its most destructive fire year ever, destroying homes and causing billions of dollars in damage. But what if you could build homes that were fire resistant? Diana Olick is in Richburg, South Carolina with her next installment of Rising Risks. Wildfires destroyed more U.S. homes and buildings last year than any other time in recorded history. And the eight most destructive years for wildfires ever have been in just the last 13 years. There is no reason to think that they're going to get better. So as you look at this kind of impact, uh, these variations in the climate have had, we are far more susceptible to the size and intensity of fires. The Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety is on the front lines of fire research. Wright is a former FEMA official and native Californian. His parents lost their home in the campfire last year, the worst in the state's history. Roughly 14,000 homes there burned to the ground. Wildfire damage to property just in California last year totaled nearly $19 billion, according to CoreLogic. There are steps that we can take so that the impact of that fire is narrowed, it doesn't spread as far, and it impacts far fewer structures in terms of that kind of generative over and over fire beginning fire beginning fire beginning fire. So the Institute built this test home, one side incorporating fireproof design and materials, the other not. So we have a six inch gap here from the top of the rock mulch to the start of the siding. And this six inch gap, just like our five foot zone, gives us a non-combustible area. A wildfire's wall of flames may look most dramatic, but it's actually the flying embers that can be even more destructive. Satellites have captured embers flying up to seven miles from a wildfire. These start secondary fires. The siding, roof, and landscaping on this home protect it from those embers. There's no such thing as a fireproof home, but there is a wildfire-resistant home. While the cost to real estate from wildfires is rising, the cost to build a fire-resistant home like this one is actually the same or even less than a typical home. The savings is in the cement siding, cheaper than wood materials. That offsets cost increases in gutters and vents. All of it far less than the cost of total loss. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Richburg, South Carolina. And before we go, a look at the final day on Wall Street. Uh, the Dow fell 133 points, third straight day of declines. The Nasdaq was down 70. The S&P was down 18. That is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for watching. We'd like to remind you that this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support. I'm Bill Griffith, and we do thank you very much for that support. Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow.